I'm going to get closer. Uh, last night I had the uh, privilege and the joy of going to an inaugural soccer game. Sacramento, if you didn't know, we, we have a mostly professional soccer team. Um, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, 20,000 plus people got together to uh, celebrate, but also to cheer on a team. And you know, what's really interesting is out of the 20 plus thousand people, I don't think anybody cared that we lost. And there was a group of people called the Tower Bridge Battalion that were cheering and jumping and singing the whole entire time, even though we were, you know, mostly down the whole game. Sports is really fun because you see a bigger picture most of the time. You are a fan more than wins and losses, and if we have Raider fans, they know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's not a diss. You are good fans. And that's the importance of kind of what we're going to talk about today. It's interesting how we can be fans of a team that can mistreat us so badly, but we stay so loyal. But in our marriages, we may not even be treated nearly half as bad or feel as bad, but we find reasons to want out. Isn't that interesting? We can go to games. We can cheer. We can leave with a team that lost and say, that was a fun time. We could sit in traffic, we could be with a guy who's obnoxious using words that you don't want your kids to hear, and still say, I like this team. I like being a part of this group. I like being a part of a fandom that is crazy. And then there's times like, you know, you go through the motions. Sacramento Kings, we were awful, but we sold everything out. We got good, sold out, and had standing room only. We went from good to bad, our expectations changed, people wanted out but yet not enough to let a team go away. We were willing to fight for something because we saw a greater picture, a greater plan. If you don't like sports, I'm sorry. I only know how to use those analogies because that's what works for me. But today, we're going to be talking about spiritual breakthroughs in marriage. And one of the things that comes up with an issue for us is we have a compromised view of what marriage is. And so we think that today in our world, that marriage is so, I mean, divorce is so common that you're expected, most likely, if you're married, to at some point get divorced. Biblical times is actually worse. You get divorced for any kind of reason. We have a compromised view of marriage. I looked up some things to get, you know, percentages and all this and that. And at one point, you know, we were spouting out these percentages of, of divorce rates that were kind of off. I mean, not necessarily fully off, but you were told what's the point of getting married because one in every two marriages ends in a divorce. And then you probably heard a statement which is kind of false, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of myth bust it here a little bit, that church-going families are more likely to get divorced than not church families. I've heard that stat. I've used that stat. It's a scare tactic. What it is is there's a lot of people who claim to be Christians who go through the motions and find ways to make excuses of, of why they need to be out. But a new survey was done of, of people who were active in their faith, who were present, who, who not only went to church, but they, you know, would rate their family Bible time or whatever it is of, of being active, faith-building families have a very high rate of staying together. But we're, we'll get back to that. But I want us to kind of take a look at... Starting off with, in order for us to have spiritual breakthroughs, we need to have a few things. So let's start from the beginning, because we took a week off, and get to where we're at, and then hit it in strides. We started out with, in order for us a lot of the to have our scripture, spiritual breakthroughs in our lives, we first have to start with an understanding David of was saying the importance of creating needs and for hearts. And renew a right spirit within, within me. I want to be in your presence. I want to have a relationship. He had a spiritual breakthrough because what happened was he cheated on his wife. I mean, he cheated on his wife. He committed adultery. It didn't stop there. And he killed off a guy. And all these things happened. In his remorse and in his understanding of, oops, he fell on his knees, humbled himself before God, knew that he deserved his consequences, but was willing to put himself out there and ask for forgiveness. In order for us to have these spiritual breakthroughs, we have to understand that we need God and that we need to ask for forgiveness. Then we went on and talked about a spiritual breakthrough in your faith. How as we mature in our faith, we have breakthroughs all the time because we're allowing God more reign within us. 
And he's breaking down our, our walls of fear and doubt and building them up with faith, forgiveness, love, grace. And we can have these breakthroughs that keep going on to help us strengthen that relationship that we're trying to build when asking for forgiveness. And then we talk about spiritual breakthroughs in our family. Our day and age wastes so much time with our kids uh, that sometimes we have to remind ourselves to put down our phones so that we can attend to our kids. Sometimes we have to remind ourselves, hey, they're not going to get everything they need at school. <laughs> they're not going to get everything they need to know about God the one hour a week they spend at church. As a family, I need to show the importance to my children about the God I serve by the way I treat their mom, by the way I raise them up, by the way that I encourage them to be a part of the discussion and not just a side note that sits in a different room while mom and dad have a conversation. These are things that we do to raise our kids up to understand the generation that knows God now isn't guaranteed to the generation after us if we don't let them know the importance of who our God is. Okay? So we encourage them, we teach them, we grow them. And that happens the best when we allow our marriage to have spiritual breakthroughs. And we talked about a compromised view of marriage. If you have your Bibles, let's open up to Matthew chapter 19. We're going to start in verse 3. We're going to skip a few verses, come back to them, go to 7 and 9. It's going to be up here, but if you have your Bibles, it's better for you to read it for yourself. So Pharisees came and tried to trap him with, with this question. Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife for just any reason? We're going to skip. We're going to go back to these verses. They're important. We're not skipping them for no reason. So put your finger back at verse 4. Then why did Moses say in the law that man could give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away? They asked. Jesus replied, Moses permitted divorce only as concession to your hard hearts. But it was not what God originally intended. And I tell you this, whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery unless his wife has been unfaithful. So they had a very compromised view of marriage. If you aren't married, or if you've gone through struggles in marriage, this lesson is for all of us because it's about more than just marriage. So, so don't check out if, if you're not in this category or thinking about it. We start to get these weird views in our compromised world of what marriage is, and we start to think that we can have these any reasons that come up. He's for any reasons. And back in Moses' time, believe it or not, it could be because they cooked a bad meal. Not throwing anything out there or any suggestions. I'm just saying they had for any kind of reasons. I had a friend that I used to work with who, uh, in joking, she was about to get married, she was engaged, and we were talking about uh, how exciting that was for her and all that stuff. She goes, yeah, he's a great guy. He'll make a great first husband. And I was like, oh, oh, oh. I'm just kidding. I was like, whoa, but the funny thing is, in our just kidding, that is our world. That we will make claims of things like, oh yeah, it'll be a great first one. We'll get it right in the round two. But, but that's kind of our world. We have this compromised view of what marriage is, and we start to rationalize things to the fault of even using scripture to make it right. And, and that's what they were doing, because they were like, well, Moses said we can do it. But what did God say? It was because of your hardened hearts. But that's not what God originally had planned. You guys couldn't take it. You didn't get the idea of what God really wanted for you. And so you were compromised in your relationship. So many of you may have heard this. You don't have to raise your hand, but if you've heard this in your head, raise your hand if you want. God wants me to be happy, so I am just going to find somebody else. Well, Scripture says it's okay for me to do this. There are things that we have read and that are in here where, where biblically there are, you know, rightful claims of getting a divorce. It's not required, but it's acceptable. But we're going to not focus on that for right now. I want us to focus on this idea of what did God intend for us? Not what we have been allowed for or what our, our hardened hearts have allowed for, but what did God intend us to be married for? It's really difficult to think about I'm making a commitment not only to a spouse but to God 
but that doesn't mean anything anymore. So I want you just to kind of hold on to that for a second. Here's what we have. God had a design for marriage and, and its commitment. And we're going to go back to those verses I skipped, and we're going to read what Jesus' answer is to them. He had a really strong point. And I want us to read. So the Pharisees come, and they try to trap him with the question. And he answers like this. Haven't you read the scriptures? Jesus replied. They record that the beginning God made them male and female. And he said, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united into one. And since they are no longer two, but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. God had a plan for us. When we, you know, it's been kind of interesting. I've had this opportunity to, to do weddings, and it makes me feel old because a lot of them are my former youth group kids. And so I go, oh, when did you get old enough to get married? But I get to go up, and we get to read the verses. So we go up, and we talk about it, and we say verses like this, and we explain to them. And hopefully, you know, I get to sit with them and talk to them about the importance of marriage and what God called us to do. And, and I love to give the example of when Adam was there and God looked at all of his creation and saw Adam, there was no fit for him. So he handcrafted him, his partner. So for today, if you're here with your spouse or if you're not, but you're thinking about them, understand that when you were created... And God looked at his creation and said, you know what, there is nobody fit for you except for this person that I'm giving you. Would that change the way that you approach them, talk to them, treated them? Do you know that the person you made is special and God made them for you? Would that change your mind? Would your compromised view of, well, she burnt my toast, so she has to go, change to, I just like burnt toast. <laughs> we have a way of changing the way we think because marriage isn't, Guaranteed to be an easy thing. Our relationship with Christ isn't guaranteed to be an easy road. It's interesting how he compares the relationship of marriage with us and, us and the church, just like we have with a partner, because it's similar. Marriage is hard, and it is difficult, but there is joy and understanding that comes with it. When I was looking up... Um, uh, some of these stats and different things like that, there is a, okay, I'll just use a personal story. For us, we have a child with a disability. <coughs> there is something that is said when you are raising a child with a disability, you are one of two people, or couples, one that, that can't make it, or ones that will never ever be broken by anything. Mm -hmm. And so they, they give you a percentage of 80% of spouses with a disability, the child with a disability, end up in divorce. And you look at it and go, oh, this is my future, there's no hope. Or you look at it and say, if we can get through the struggle, there's nothing that will ever break us because we see a better and bigger picture. And so for us, we, Renee and I, we had some struggles in finding out a lot of things because we're human. And, and what happens as humans is we have to battle through these emotions that we don't know about. And so like the example as before, as we are fans that go out and we cheer on a team, even though they aren't great or it's going to fall apart, we don't know what's going to happen, we still go because we see a bigger picture. At the moment, it's hard to see a bigger picture when you find out news that, that is difficult. So let's take away child with disability and put in, I found out my, my spouse has a terminal illness, or I find out that there's something wrong that came up in our marriage, and we go, okay, do we implode and say we give up, or do we look at a bigger picture of what God has called us for? Renee and I had a struggle of figuring out, figuring out are we the right parents uh, to raise this child? And, and after discussion and after just praying and letting God work within us, we knew who we were. And then we had the biggest fight of a child who had heart surgery that almost we almost lost. You know? And so in our struggle, we were so fused together because we knew that we had to rely on each other and God to bring us through something that was so traumatic. And without our marriage, if it was a compromised view... I would just pull off and try to do my own thing. But we had a bigger picture view. A view of a family that we wanted to raise up under God's control. And it started with us submitting ourselves first. Amen. And so we had to come together to pray that God would see us through. And since then, yes, there are struggles and ups and downs, but we now have a foundation of where do we go. And it is a cheesy slogan, but a couple who does pray together 
stay together. And it's, and it's the truth, because what you're doing is not only are you submitting to God, but you're allowing yourselves as a couple to say, God, you are in control, and we know that you want the best for us. Now, let's take your marriage out, just because I want this to be relevant and applicable to everybody who is here. There is something about a commitment and standing by what you say and what you promise to God. And if you aren't willing to go there, don't make it. Because God holds us to the commitments. Don't swear by things unless you're going to fulfill them. So here's what God has. He has a design for marriage. There's like some responsibilities within it. There's ways that we can find spiritual breakthroughs through it because it's a roller coaster. We go up and down. But there are some responsibilities that he has for us. So let's go to Genesis chapter 2. In verse uh, 18 through 22, and then we're going to jump to Ephesians chapter 5. So I'll let you mark your stuff, and then we'll go back and forth. Then the Lord said, It is not good for a man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them. But the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals, but still there was no helper just right for him. So the Lord caused the man to fall asleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed the opening up. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. He needed a partner. He needed that person to help him get through what, what God was calling him for. He needed that person to lean on. He needed somebody to trust, somebody who can relate, somebody who can share stories with, someone who can pick him up when he falls down. I'm sorry the cows weren't doing it. They just looked at him in mood. He needed that person who could sit in conversation and say, we can get through this. And then Ephesians 5, 22 through 25 says, For wives, this means submit to your husbands, as to the Lord. And for husbands, uh, is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of His body, the church, as, I'm oh, sorry, the body of the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. We take this out of context a lot. Okay? We go through things and say, the Bible says, woman, you need to submit to me and make me a sandwich or whatever. That's not what God says. It's just not. So you're going to erase it and do this. If I am at the head of my household and God has called me to love and take care of my family and my spouse, I have to love my wife just as Christ loved what? The church. Christ loved the church so much, what did he do? We jumped the gun. He did a lot of things before he died. He forgave people. He loved people. He showed grace and mercy to people. He was willing to take on all of our faults and not boot us to the curb, but say, I'm still going to forgive you and we're going to work through this. Every day I'm going to call you to me even though you have forsaken me and were unfaithful. We aren't willing to go that route a lot of times. We ask you to prove it to us first. We say, I will give you forgiveness, but you have to show me that you're sorry I want a written letter that says, you apologize. But I'm still going to keep it in my back pocket so when you mess up, I'm going to pull it out and say, do you remember that time? I forgave you for that. Do you remember? There's no strings for, for Jesus and his love for the church. So for us, as, as men, as husbands, as examples to our children, when we interact with our wives, we are interacting as Christ did for the church. I don't know if we know this, but we have little eyes that look at us. And they may not be our children's eyes. They may be other little eyes looking at us. And we are an example of what God has called us to be for them too. So as a youth minister, before I, I was here, um, I had a lot of kids who had just kind of hard upbringings. Ones whose parents were always in and out of relationships and, and struggles. And every once in a while, Renee and I said, you know, we are not maybe the perfect examples of this, but we know that we love God and we love each other. So we would kidnap some of our, that's the wrong word. We would, we would go and pick up some of our youth group kids and bring them to our house so that they could sit with us and have dinner and enjoy, uh, you know, a family that loves God together. 
we encourage them. We show them the example of, of our love for one another so that they can see, you know, not every relationship is like the one that you have at home. Part of having a spiritual breakthrough in our lives is, is understanding what God wants for us, what God wants for our relationship, and what God wants for our family. And knowing that it's not going to be a perfect, well-paved road, that there's going to be some times we have to go off the trail, bring out the machete to cut back some of the weeds, and be able to make it to where God wants us to go. And it's hard, but it is possible. It is possible. You know what's really interesting, if, if you go back to, uh, I'm going to pull this up for me, I don't have it on the board, so go back to Matthew chapter 19 in your Bibles. I, I want, this caught me and it was really interesting, if you go back and you read the verses right after where we left off, sorry, technology is fun. So go back to Matthew chapter 19, we're going to go right at the end of that paragraph. Here we go. And it's interesting because after Jesus tells them all these things, okay. so after Jesus goes through and tells them, this is why a man leaves his father, and, and they get bonded together, and they're no longer two but one, don't let anybody take them apart. Okay. And verse 7 down, it says, then, you know, they had come back with them, why did Moses say in the law that a man could give his wife a written divorce and send her away? They asked, and he says, Moses permitted divorce because of concessions to your hard hearts, but it's also not what God had originally intended. And I tell you this, whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery unless his wife has been unfaithful. Here's the kicker in, in, in verse 10. Jesus' disciples then said to him, if this is the case, it's better not to marry at all. And Jesus gives him this. Not everyone can accept this statement. It's easier just to not have to go through stuff. But I'll tell you this, it's a lot nicer to go through it with somebody. It's a difficult and a hard road, but there are opportunities through the journey for you to allow God to prick your heart and say, hey, not only did we make it another year, but we can get better at this. Knowing that there may be times that you slip a little bit to have to get picked back up. But just like our road to God and through our service to Christ, we are going to hit some pitfalls. But if we keep the understanding of God gives us forgiveness and grace, we can also have an understanding with our children, our spouses, and our friends that we can offer that same thing. Not with wanting anything else back in return. So as we go through this journey, and as we end our spiritual breakthroughs with this piece, and I wanted to end with this on purpose because I think this is our first ministry as families. It starts at, at home. Even with, with me, the thing that I, I, I talked with the guys when, when I interviewed for this job is the first thing that I have to do and make sure I'm doing well is raising my family and being a good husband. And then if I'm doing that right, I will be a great minister for this place. But if I am neglecting them, I won't be able to give everything to here. And so I think the same needs to go with with all of us and really look inside and say, I know we talk about a great commission and I know we talk about going into all the world and making disciples, but if we aren't making them at home first, then what's the point? Our goal is to start where it's important. God wants us to raise up good godly children and have a good godly relationship. There are going to be struggles and there are reasons of why divorce needs to happen sometimes and I don't want you to stay with somebody who's hurting you physically or, or whatever, but I think more of the importance is what Christ really wants in your relationship, what he really called you to. And even though there may be struggles, if you have ever said the words that I have loved you and I have committed myself to you, you can always get back to that statement because you want to know why? The same statement goes with no matter how far you've fallen away from Christ, if you've ever said in your life that I love you and I believe that you are my savior, there's always a road back to him. And we have that joy and that comfort in knowing that even when we are unfaithful, that God is always faithful to us because he can't deny himself. And if that's his love for his church and for his people, then we can offer that same love and that same respect to our spouses as well. You know, we have a great opportunity to show the world that the percentages of marriage that they are throwing at us 
um, don't have to be our outcome. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to give up before you try because, well, you know, it's just an inevitability that's going to happen. I want you to be strong and to know that God is with you and He can give you so much more than you could ever ask or imagine. But it takes time to be in that relationship with Him together. So if you've been struggling in that and maybe you need some support or some help, we have people who would love to sit and pray with, with you as a couple, as a family. Maybe you're just a, an individual who has been struggling with the idea of what God is calling you to and what your purpose is and, and what He wants for you. We would love to sit and pray with you too. And if you have been thinking about taking Him on in baptism to be a part of the family, to accept that He came and He died and He rose for you, we have that opportunity to, to do that this morning. I just want you to know, before we leave and before we do a, a song of invitation, before we pray, that the words of David are so important for all of this to happen for you today. That I hope that maybe we can start this as a theme for your life, that when you wake up, you can say that prayer that David said. That you can ask, God created me a clean heart. Renew your spirit within me. Don't cast me away from your presence, Lord. But bring me back. Give me that spirit to sustain your calling for me. We, we can start every day so great. We can end it the same way too and allow God to be in control and say, God, I want to submit my life to you so that I can be better at the things that you need me to do. Better at being patient with my kids. Better at being loving to my spouse. Better at being forgiving to whoever needs it. Being slower to anger, quicker to love. Being full more of those fruits of the Spirit. It doesn't just happen overnight, but it is a process in which each time we find a way to it, it is another breakthrough of our lives that can make us to be so much more full of joy in our lives, so much more full of purpose, and so much more uh, full of a calling that God has for us. That way, your bucket that keeps getting holes in it that you're trying to fill, you can find better ways of filling it than searching for all these other things that the world is offering you that will never, ever sustain you. But instead... You'll look straight to the bread of life, the light of the world, the truth, the good shepherd, the one who can fill you up and overflow you with an abundance of, of joy. Let's go to God and pray. Then, Father, Lord, you are an awesome God. We are so grateful that you love us. That you made this universe, the stars in the sky, the trees, the birds, the animals, but you still found us and made us to be your people. We are so undeserving of your love and of your grace and of your comfort and of your hand that sits with us all the time waiting for us to come back and embrace us. Lord, we know that you do so much for us and we can't do anything to repay it but to live a life and enjoy it that you gave us. One that is full of purpose that you call us to. To spend time listening to you, submitting to you, Spend time with our spouses and our family giving praise to you, giving our, our concerns to you, giving our joys to you. In our work, we're glorifying your name, even if it is not a work of, uh, you know, a, a spiritual work. Even if it's physical, we can make it spiritual by the way we act, by our integrity, by how we treat our co-workers. There are so many ways that we can show that we are your children. I pray that we do it more often. Lord, please create in us a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within us. Lord, help us to not be cast away from your presence, but to be drawn to you, to build our relationships up with you, to be filled with your joy. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Let's stand and sing a song.